Coming up on tonight's Faith versus Culture, journalist Brandon Showalter takes us inside the transgender debate. Coming right up. To have a sex before you marry is a bad idea. Don't tell me there's no such thing as gun violence. That just depends on your definition of when life begins. There are problems of sin and habit that cannot be solved outside the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to Faith versus Culture. I'm Billy Hollowell, and as always, I'm joined by Trey Goins Phillips. Trey, how's it going today? It's good. I'm glad to be here. So we've got a lot to dive into today. We're going to be talking about the transgender issue. And Trey, I don't know about you, but one of the really intriguing things about this to me and troubling things has been the pace at which this is sort of unfolded in culture. Have you been surprised to see how fast this has all happened? Well, I was going to say, I'm not surprised that it is happening, but the fact that it's happened so quick, I think is alarming. And I think a lot of it is due to the pandemic. Obviously, this was the direction we were going anyway, but I think we've moved into this obsession with social media. So where we saw things that were kind of crazy and on the fringe on social media and everybody started consuming it and it's become more normalized. And I think that just sped up what was the inevitable, unfortunately. Well, and I can tell you that out of all the people who have looked at this issue, our guest who is coming on here in a moment, Brandon Showalter, he's a reporter at the Christian Post. He has probably looked at this more than almost anyone analyzing it, diving into it, exposing different elements of the movement. And so, Brandon, we want to welcome you to the show. How are you doing today? Hi, Billy. It's good to be with you. All right, so we want to dive into a number of things. I think, obviously, the big thing you have going on right now is this new podcast, Generation Indoctrination, that um, you've just released, and you're going episode by episode. It's a five-part series, uh, really intriguing content. Uh, so let's just, I guess we'll start there, and then I want to get into your story. But, but what was it that made you want to sort of take this into a podcast format? I think podcasts are a really great medium these days. More and more people are listening to them. And the podcast format is enables a longer, more elaborate conversation to happen between, you know, people and a variety of different, you know, experts who struggle as it is, especially in our corporate media climate to get their voices out there. There's only so much you can say in a few sentences if you can make it into an article. And that's fine. I mean, I do print journalism as well. But a podcast conversation really allows people to sort of take a journey. Um, And so we wanted to do a multi-part series exploring the various angles that I've been covering for the last several years here at the Christian Post. And so we're very pleased with what we've produced. Um, I do encourage everyone to go listen to it. Hmm. You know, Brandon, this is obviously a hot button issue. It's something that has kind of taken the the, the nation and even uh, the world in, in a way by storm. Uh, but it's like I said, it's, since it is hot button, it's very controversial uh, and it takes a lot to decide to weigh into this. Can you tell us some of the backstory? What motivated your interest in tackling this particular topic? Well, there were a number of things that happened when I first got started as a journalist back in 2016. And I was not intending to get into these hot button issues, but there are some things that when you learn what is happening, you just can't look away. And I remember one moment in particular, soon after I got started in journalism, where the Holy Spirit spoke to me, Uh, my editor, one of my editors had asked if any of us, the reporters would be willing to tackle a, a subject of what they call conversion therapy. And that was being applied to the gender identity policies. Always put that in air quotes, gender identity, where if someone was confused about their bodies, their biological sex, that they were not going to be allowed to receive any kind of counseling to help them be okay with their birth sex. And I remember thinking, do I want to really write about this? This, I've just gotten started as a journalist. I here, I started to do that Washington, D.C. hedging kind of thing, thinking about my career. Is this going to tarnish future opportunities? And there were these laws being considered in various locales and in certain states. And as I start to mull around in my mind about all of that, I just, as clear as day, heard the Holy Spirit speak to me and say, are you ashamed of the gospel? And it was just that one little phrase. And then I remember thinking, doggone it, no. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, Lord. And so then I just heard that still small voice say, then write the article. 
And so I did. And that's when I started falling down the rabbit hole. Uh, and a few months later, I learned what puberty blockers were, these drugs that are given to children who are gender confused and how it halts their natural normal puberty. And as I have often said, something inside me snapped. I just could not believe that they were doing this to young kids. My grid previously was, oh, these you know, transvestites down at Mardi Gras in New Orleans, or yeah, you see a few people in Hollywood doing this, but this is just you know Bruce Jenner, you know all that. I knew it was maybe increasing a little bit, but I had no idea as to the scope. And certainly not that they were doing this to children in children's hospitals. And so as soon as I learned about the medical scandal that it is, I just knew that I was going to have to do journalistic work about it. We did a series on these issues in 2017 at the Christian Post, but ever since I've been one of the lead reporters, if not the lead reporter here, to scrutinize this ideology, particularly its devastating effects on children. I can't stand seeing children be abused, and this is one of the worst child abuse mm -hmm. medical scandals the world has ever seen, and I will not stop until I see it end. When you go back to when you heard that voice, when you heard God speak to you and you were thinking about your career, and I think a lot of people can relate to that, right? There's a tough issue, and we'll talk about this later on, but there's a tough issue. They're not really sure what to do. You, know, you had to make a choice there, and it would have been really easy to still hear the Holy Spirit and make and say, you know what, God, I'm not the one. It's not for me. It's for someone else, and you, you have it wrong, and to sort of turn away from that. What kept you going? Because you said you fell down that rabbit hole. Once you started, what was it that really made you say, okay, I'm going to push on no matter what the consequences are? One of the things is just that I hate injustice. And so, and again, because it was involving children, um, I'm not a parent yet, uh, but I love kids and I just can't stand seeing them hurt and abused. And so, you know, Jesus has some pretty strong words for those who hurt children. He doesn't take too kindly to that. And so that kept me going. But the other thing I think is that I realized and have come to believe, have always believed, but believe even more strongly today than I did even then, was that these issues are central to the furtherance of the gospel and the advance of God's kingdom. This is not a secondary or tertiary doctrinal matter. You can't get Genesis wrong without getting the whole gospel wrong. It means something profound to be a human person. Our bodies themselves declare the gospel. And so if we lose this ground, we've lost everything. And I'm just not willing to compromise. And the Christian Post, thankfully, shares that same theological vision. These, these issues matter deeply to us as a publication. Um, so that just really kept me going. Because these are central issues to the furtherance of the gospel, I felt like what I was doing was a sacred calling. Um, but the beauty of all of this, I think, is that even as there are many people who don't agree with Christians on these touchy issues, you'd be surprised that when you actually speak the truth and you work hard and do it no matter what, many people, even if they disagree with you, will read your work and engage with you thoughtfully. And especially parents of those who have children that are now mired in this gender madness. Uh, they tell me they can't believe they're reading the Christian Post now, but they are. And so oh, that DC hedging mindset where I was debating if this is really going to advance me or not, well, it turns out that what I thought might impede my career has actually only furthered it. Now, it's still hard, and there are people who I know would never hire me because of the work I've done, but it doesn't matter because if you're doing it unto the Lord, that's really all that counts at the end of the day. And so I am very, I'm just, I'm so, I'm so thankful for my editors who have backed me up and backed the rest of my colleagues up as we've been reporting on these issues. I'm not the only one who has ever reported on these themes. I have great colleagues and they do amazing reporting as well. You know, to that end, we live in a world that's so, I think, uh, mired in uh, in relativism, right? Where this this commitment to not nailing ourselves down on anything, it's everything is kind of whatever you believe, whatever you like, your truth and my truth has kind of become uh, the siren song of the generation. Uh, so as a journalist, obviously you have an obligation to report facts, uh, but as a Christian, your higher obligation uh, is to the truth, the ultimate truth of the gospel. Mm -hmm. I want to ask Brandon, as a journalist and as a believer, how do you balance those two things and bring it to bear in your work? It can be a tough balancing act. There's no question about that, because you do want to say the truth in love. Uh, and I think grace precedes truth, but you do have to do both. And so I don't claim to do it perfectly. I've said things that I've regretted. And I've had to apologize for things that I've said that were 
you know, not said in love. And then there have been times when I've hesitated and not said the truth when I probably should have. So it is, it is a, I'm always sort of triaging it with the Holy Spirit, with the Lord is like, okay, God, I know I must say something now. I know I have to report on something. Journalistically, I feel a certain sense of obligation. And there is so much injustice in the world and you can't do it all. And I, I get people messaging me about this. Well, don't you care about this? I'm like, of course I do. I'm just, I'm just covered up with work. You can't do it all. Um, but on these issues especially, again, because they are so central to the advance of the kingdom and the furtherance of the gospel, I think every Christian has to care about them. And yes, it can be difficult. And yes, I think we need to have compassion for people who are truly struggling. And I don't know a single sincere, biblically orthodox, faithful Christian who wouldn't want to have compassion on people. But I have become convinced lately that sometimes that compassion is being weaponized and it's being used to, in in a sinister way, inhibit people from ever speaking some hard truths Mm -hmm. that need to be said. Um, I, I, one of the saddest stories that I ever heard was from a man who had lived for many years in blithe, uh, hedonism, you know, very, uh, I mean, just lived like the devil. And as he lay dying on his hospital bed, I mean, no one had ever taught him or told him about the purpose and meaning of the human body. And as he's there dying of several diseases, his last words were, I didn't know, I didn't know, I didn't know. It just crushed me to hear that because, as it says, I believe in the book of Hosea, for lack of knowledge, my people perish. He didn't know and he perished. And so I just won't have that on my conscience. I just won't. I'm willing to say these hard things and be willing to make the mistakes of maybe not being as gracious as I ought to be sometimes, but I'm going to certainly try to be gracious. Um, But doing both is indeed a balancing act. Brandon, that is such a powerful word there. We're going to take a break and we'll be back in just a moment with more Faith versus Culture on the CBN News Channel. Welcome back to Faith versus Culture. We are here with Brandon Showalter. Now, Brandon, you were just talking about so many really interesting things. We could go for an hour and a half on, or longer on these topics. But one of the things about your new podcast, Generation Indoctrination, that is so interesting is how you approached it, right? You didn't necessarily approach this through a distinctly Christian lens. And you had people on this show, you have people on the show who aren't necessarily conservatives or Christians. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yes. The truth is true no matter who says it. And in the course of doing frontline investigative reporting on these issues, I've engaged with a wide variety of people, many Christians, but many who are not, Republicans, Democrats, conservatives, liberals, experts from a variety of fields. And I figured the best thing to do was to show the breadth and width and depth of scrutiny and thoughtful writing that has, you know, that has happened in, in this space. And so my goal was to engage as many voices as I could that all bring some unique insights to the table and collate and compile them into a podcast series. And I'm really delighted with the product that we've created because uh, I don't believe in squelching people's voices. And so if they are informed or motivated by their faith and they talk about God, I certainly let them say that. And But we don't get very preachy here either. Not that we're ashamed of the gospel, but and hopefully maybe this will serve as an on-ramp to the gospel, but I've got atheists and agnostics, I mean, people who don't have any faith at all talking about what it's like in the media, um, because I'll tell you, uh, I often say this and I'll say it again. I believe that the mass media, the journalists, the corporate media organizations are the reason for this medical scandal, but for the, but for the corruption and uh, the cover that they are providing to these doctors who are disfiguring and sterilizing children and young people. If it weren't for the media covering for them, none of this would be happening. Just today in the Associated Press, they were reporting on some article, uh, it was the trial in Arkansas where they're going to trial over their law that they passed um, to prohibit uh, the mutilation and the the sterilizing trans treatments of, of children in that state. And the headline was blaring about how trial begins over Arkansas ban on trans youth care. The manipulation of language and the euphemisms and all of the 
deceptive ways in which these issues have been reported is an absolute disgrace. This is one of the worst periods in media history because they are actively covering up a horrendous medical scandal. But I will engage the honest journalists out there. And so even if they're not Christian, if they're telling the truth and they will defend the fundamental integrity of the human body, I will listen and I will bring their voices to, I will highlight them. And so that's what we've done in this podcast. We speak with medical experts, investigative journalists, uh, a pediatric endocrinologist, bioethicist, uh, a historian of gender, so many different angles, five episodes. We've got a very thorough yet succinct uh, podcast, and I'm we're real proud of it. You know, you've made clear, obviously, that you're, you, as you just said, you're willing to work with anybody, you'll talk to anybody, as long as their commitment is also to the truth. Um, I, I want to ask you, as a journalist and as a Christian, how have you found, because you're, you're fighting an uphill battle, as you just said, with all of the media, the corporate media kind of uh, running defense uh, for all that's happening, how have you found is the best way, not just as a believer, but as a journalist, is the best way to communicate with people and maybe break through some of that mess uh, to communicate what's actually happening that, that the mainstream media won't tell people? I think the first step is to recognize the ideological underpinnings of what's going on and refuse to participate in the linguistic uh, manipulation. We don't employ a uh, transgender woman, for example, because it eclipses the truth of biological sex. We will say trans identified because it is an identity construct, not a sex. We refuse to lie about biology. And biology, as one of my favorite atheist evolutionary biology says, is our collective tether to reality. So if you emphasize reality, whatever you believe about God, and I believe he's the ultimate reality, but even if you don't believe in God, you know, science is science. And so we refuse to use our very means of communication in service to a dogma that is untethered from material reality. That speaks volumes to a lot of people, whether they are Christian or not. Um, and oftentimes I've just, it's not as though, again, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And I believe you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free, as Jesus said in the gospel of John. But you don't even always have to say that because if you speak truthfully and with precise words, it's, it get, really cuts through a lot of the, uh, the mumbo jumbo and the, the euphemisms. We, we just, we won't play that game. I mean, we, we will not lie. <laughs> Journalists shouldn't lie. <laughs> Yeah. Well, that should be the central tenet of, of all of this. And yet, you know, here we are. I think there's so much confusion. And because of that confusion, just to kind of build upon what you're saying, and you know this better than anyone, but that anxiety that people have in speaking out, there are a couple of different factors, right? The first factor being that for a long time, and you spoke to this before, this was an issue that seemed sort of fringe, not one that was going to be out in the mainstream. So it didn't feel like it was something that everybody had to speak on, but that has changed. And at the same time, the media has sort of come in and they have a narrative on this. And so a lot of people who have a biblical worldview and even those who don't are sitting there and they're saying, I want to speak up. Um, but particularly for Christians who want to speak up, but they're feeling that fear, that apprehension that maybe you even felt at the beginning before you dove into that first story. What would you say to them about why it's essential to speak out on this topic? I would ask them, will they have it on their conscience to know that today doctors will go to work and cut the breasts off of troubled teen girls. Doctors will go to work and castrate you know, prepubescent boys and surgically castrate teenage boys. Will you be able to go to sleep tonight and know that that's happening and you said nothing? Ask yourself, are you comfortable seeing social media timelines full of teenage girls with gashes slashed across their midsection because they've had their breasts cut off by these gruesome exhibitionist doctors that market this on TikTok. Are you okay with that? Are you okay with the complete collapse of biomedical ethics? I don't think you are. And it is the compassionate thing to tell the truth, even if it's uncomfortable, because the bodies of children are literally on the line. Well, Brandon, we so appreciate your heart and your passion for this. And obviously, the show is Generation Indoctrination. You can go to generationindoctrination.com to listen to the podcast. We appreciate you taking the time today. Thank you so much. Everyone else, we'll be right back in just a moment.
Welcome back to Faith versus Culture. Trey, that was a really deep and interesting conversation. A lot of hard topics to unpack there. Yeah, you know, I think, unfortunately, we're to this place culturally, right, where we have to address these really difficult topics, and we have to be specific about it. Like, we've got to be honest, this is what's going on. Uh, Because, uh, as Brandon was saying, we live in a world where we have all of these media gatekeepers who are wanting to romanticize this issue, right, and act as if this is actually a wonderful thing that we're doing to minors. Um, But, you know, we have to keep in mind that these kids are not even allowed to smoke, they can't vote, they can't buy alcohol. And what's the reason? Because we don't see them legally as mature enough to do it. But we can allow them to do these things that will forever alter their bodies, uh, it just doesn't make sense. So we need to be honest about this conversation. Yeah, I think honest. And then the other piece was a boldness, right? That love and truth mix and the fact that he was afraid to do it, but he stood up and he spoke and he's doing he's doing this. So if he can do it, I think it does show. Yeah, you know what? He's doing it in a really big way where his name is all over. I think maybe I could step up and have the conversation that is difficult with somebody else. So that that's the other part for me that really resonated. I think it's a great example of somebody going first, right? Because Brandon is saying, look, I've got this platform. I am a journalist. I have access to some of these people. So I'll do the really difficult part of speaking the truth bluntly. All you have to do is listen to it and then share it. You know, talk about this information with like-minded people in hopes that then they They'll spread outside of their circles, right? And talk to people who aren't like-minded, but are maybe open to at least listening to an honest conversation. And Brandon does a great job of bringing truth, but being compassionate at the same time. He does. And you can hear him over at generationindoctrination.com. We're going to take one more break. We'll be right back with more Faith versus Culture. Well, that is all we have time for on today's episode of Faith vs. Culture on the CBN News Channel. Thanks for being here. You can find more on CBNNews.com and FaithWire.com. 